and thank you for joining us. And you got to hear us doing a little bit of uh, prep and setup. So welcome to our second session of the ISIS conference uh, Thursday. What does that make it day four? We have three excellent presentations on data literacy, which is a very hot topic in our conference so far, it's just terrific. So I will give some speaker introductions and then we'll get right into our presentations. Feel free to drop uh, questions in the Q&A, um, use the chat for more informal chatting with each other. So I'm very pleased to present our first speakers are Dr. Vanessa Higgins. Uh, she's a social researcher working for the UK Data Service and based at the University of Manchester. She is Director of User Support and Training for the UK Data Service, where she leads the UK National Program of Data Training for Researchers and Lecturers. At the University of Manchester, Vanessa co-leads the Data Skills and Training Research Group, and she is a lecturer on the Social Statistics Undergraduate Module, Unequal Societies. Vanessa was co-investigator on the Impotera Data Project that they will be presenting on, and she's joined by Jackie Carter, Professor of Statistical Literacy at the University of Manchester. She has had a varied career characterized by working to provide access and support for students and researchers of socioeconomic data. She spent 10 years working for the UK Data Service, finishing her role there in 2013 as Director of Impact and Communications. Since then, she has developed a paid internship program at the University of Manchester to provide undergraduate students opportunity to practice their data skills in the workplace through two month long data driven research led projects. I can't wait to hear about this. In six years, 250 students have participated with another 50 taking part in the summer of 2021. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Jen. Okay, I'll go into the presentation then. So yes, I'm Vanessa and my colleague Jackie uh, is presenting with me. So we're gonna tell you about this exciting Empadera data project that we've been working on. And the word empadera data comes from the Spanish word empadera, which means to empower. So this is about empowering people with data skills. Okay, so um, the outline of the presentation will be that Jackie will give you an introduction to the empadera data project, so kind of the background, where it came from. Then she'll hand over to me to talk about the methodology and the results. And then right at the end, Jackie will come in and round up with next steps. And just to say that this was funded by the UK's Global Challenges Research Fund uh, Research Partner Development Scheme. That's a mouthful. Okay, so over to you, Jackie. Thank you, yes. Vanessa. Thank you. So I don't know if you can see me now on screen, but I'm waving to all of you, um, some of you who I know through previous ISIS conferences, and it's really lovely to be back to talk about my new work. Um, so the background, the backdrop to the project that we're going to talk to you about today is this what we've called Data Fellows Programme that we established at the University of Manchester in 2013 and which has resulted in the book, as you can see on the slide there. So in April 2021, 20, uh, a month ago, uh, the book that I'm holding there, Work Placements, Internships and Applied Social Research was published and it draws heavily on the programme of placing undergraduate students into the workplace for a two month long period in the summer at the end of their second year. So typically um, university degrees uh, in the UK are three years long. So at the end of their second year, they've done some statistical learning in the classroom and we put them into the workplace to practice those skills in a whole range of different organizations in the public sector, the private sector and the um, not-for-profit sector. And what I decided to do because so many people were asking me you know what, what's the value of this and how can you evidence it I wrote a book so the book is full of um, case studies but it's also theoretically informed so I talk about experiential learning in the first couple of chapters about the theory of why why do experiential learning to acquire social research skills and it's predominantly quantitative research skills and so if you're interested in finding out a bit more about the program it might be a good idea to have a look at the book and order it and um as I say, it's full of case studies and stories of students who have either done it 
or are in the workplace doing social research careers now. And I've collected some vignettes from the sort of typical organisations that students go to. So that provides, thanks Vanessa, that provides a backdrop for what is the Empedera Data Project. And I thought um, it'd be nice to have a bit of a timeline. And one of the points I really want to make on this slide is sometimes when things gestate, so uh, May 2008 was the initial gestation of this project, they can still take a long time to follow through and form into what, what you hear us talk about today. So back in 2008 at ISS in Stanford, um, I presented in a, in a session called Innovation in the Use of International Data for Teaching and Learning. And that's when I was still working at the UK Data Service. It might even have been the ESDS then, the Economic and Social Data Service. And at that event, Eric Swanson, who was then Head of Development Data at the World Bank, also presented. And after the event, Eric came over to the UK on a visiting um, uh, professorship, I forget what it was, but he came over to the UK and we did some work together which resulted in a paper looking at statistical literacy development, both at the country level, so he was talking about statistical capacities of countries to be able to collect and deliver um, statistical data, and we were looking at it very much from the perspective of training undergraduate students to do data analysis using all the amazing data sets that we've, we've got through the UK Data Service. And then between 2011 and 2013, what um, happened was I bid for some funding from a programme called QSTEP. And QSTEP was a national initiative in the UK to help develop the undergraduate uh, capacity in quantitative research skills training. So it was felt that too few, well, it was empirically known that too few um, graduate students out of social science courses were able to go into the workplace to do the quantitative social research that was required of them. So this programme QSTEP was a response to that and the, the uh, UK government invested in it. There were 17 centres funded around universities in the UK and we got one of the grants. And then with that grant, what we did was set up the Data Fellows Programme that I talked about on the previous slide. And we started with just 13 in, in summer 2014. And since then, we placed over 250 students as, uh, with another 50 to go this summer. And then that enabled me to start talking about the programme at conferences. So this slide towards the, this image towards the right of the slide is me talking at the Royal Statistical Society conference in 2018. And in the bottom right hand corner there is somebody called Grace, Grace de Souza, and she had um, done her data fellows placement with Open Data Watch in Washington DC. So she was actually looking at disaggregated where there was disaggregated data, sex disaggregated data for the SDGs and helping Open Data Watch pull that together into their platform. And at that conference, we, we spoke as you do at conferences and we, just, we hatched what became the Empedera Data Project. We're working with an organization that the woman on the right there, Deirdre, who um, was also at Open Data Watch, had a connection with Data Pop Alliance, which is the organization that we uh, worked in partnership with and developed a grant. So on the next slide, if you may, Vanessa, thank you. What we decided to do was to work in the three countries, um, Colombia, Mexico and Brazil as our case study sites because Data Pop Alliance had good connections with those countries and they had um, partner relationships in country. And one of the things we wanted to test out was whether the Data Fellows program had relevance for each of those countries as a way to develop statistical skills capacity. So we decided to work with those three countries and that's what the is going to talk about. But also we use a framework of the SDGs to <clears throat> help us frame the work that we wanted to do because that was becoming much more widely used and understood. So, and the University of Manchester does a lot of work with the SDGs. In fact, it is, um, as of last month, it, it, the University of Manchester ranks number one in the world for all of the work it does, teaching, learning, and professional services work as measured against the SDGs. So there was a very strategic and important reason why we did that. And the next slide I'm not going to talk to very much, but just to say, if you move on a slide, Vanessa, please, thank you. In terms of the country context um, and relating back to what I said about statistical capacity within countries, we had done some desk research and with the, um, the in-country 
links through Data Pop Alliance. We selected those countries because we knew that they did have decent statistical systems that would enable us to ask some of the research questions that we wanted to explore. So I think that's enough. I'm not going to go through all of the bullet points on this slide, but I hope that is enough to explain what, where, which countries we chose and where we started and where it came from. So Vanessa, over to you. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Jackie. Um, okay, so the methodology for this project was carried out in three stages. So the first stage was in May 2019, where Jackie and I went to Sao Paulo and held a working group session with participants from the three countries, Brazil, Colombia and Mexico. And all the participants were involved in data advocacy work, and we did this with Data Pop Alliance. Um, the second stage then, so that, that, that initial stage led on to the second stage, which was the empirical research, which involved qualitative interviews and some a bit of data science work around the state of data literacy within the three countries. And that was all done remotely. And then the final stage, stage three, was in the October of 2019. So it's, it's quite a quick project, you can see. Um, and that was a workshop held in Manchester in the UK with key stakeholders and potential partners to explore ways of moving forward with uh, the Empedera Data project. So I'll go through each of these in turn. So this is a lovely photograph of everybody involved in the working group session in Sao Paulo, and some of them have become really good friends. Um, and this was a two day working group session um, and it gathered approximately 25 actually participants from different sectors and they were from either civil society, academia, private or the public sector um, and as I said all of them were involved in data advocacy work and the aim of the session was to map the needs for training in data literacy, to identify potential partners for future fellowship programs and to present the current QSTEP internship model, which Jackie's just spoken about and explore how applicable that would be to these three pilot countries. And if this works, we can see here, it's one of the partners, is that working? That yeah. um, we've, we've gone forward with in Colombia, Rafael, and then there's another partner here who actually left the university in Brazil, but we're working with one of his colleagues now as well. So, um, so that was the first stage. So, so we get, we got lots of interest in this from the work group session, lots of ideas. So the second stage was then to partner up with Data Pop Alliance again to do some research and data collection. So we conducted 18 qualitative interviews 15 of them were with stakeholders from each of the three countries um, that focused on data literacy needs and the QSTEP model. And again, the sample of interviewees was selected to represent the diversity of sectors and as much as possible to provide uh, within countries a gender and regional representation. So we conducted six interviews in Brazil, five in Mexico and four in Colombia, and they were with people like Jackie, who's a prof or lecturer in, um, in quants, quants data in the universities in the different countries, or people who worked in civil society organizations. For example, there's one in Brazil, which is called Data for Good. So it was it was that kind of those kind of people who were interviewing. And then we did another three interviews which focused on the sustainable development goals with professionals working in the national statistical office within each of the three countries and they were the people who were in charge of the 2030 SDG agenda within each country and that was to understand the monitoring and evaluation system uh, for the SDGs within each country. So all the interviews were conducted in Portuguese, Spanish and English and they were conducted online via Zoom. Before everybody was using Zoom I hasten to add um, and okay and the data science bit was actually done by Data Pop Alliance, so I can't tell you the ins and outs of how they did it, but um, it was really lovely. They, 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 they did a visualization, which I'll show you on the next slide, and this was for use in the SDG interviews and also to support the choice of which SDG we might choose uh, to go forward with on the next phase of the project. 
Okay, so no, sorry, it's not the next slide that the visualization's on, it's the one after. Um, okay, so the interview guides, we designed a semi-structured interview guide. The data literacy interviews, we looked at data literacy training, availability and need, inequalities in the capacity um, for data training. So any gender, race, um, income, et cetera, inequalities within training and the interest in the, the adoption of the QSTEP internship model and for the sustainable development goals questions we asked about the impression of how well they they do in terms of the national monitoring and evaluation towards the sdgs we also asked them to point us to other people who could help us in our research or key resources as well and we asked them which goal or indicator would be relevant to work on within the context of their country Okay, so this is the bit of data science I was talking about. So the purpose of this um, was to kind of create this visualization for use in the interviews. And we, Data Pop Alliance used the SDGs Global Indicator Framework. They collected information by web scraping the status of measurement of each indicator from the official page uh, within each country. Um, which tracks SDGs measurements. So it was the National Stats Office pages. They did a bit of manual data collection as well where it wasn't possible to web scrape. And so based on that information, they created this lovely wheel, which each one you can see is a one of the different SDGs. Um, this is the higher level of, of SDG. And so if, if it's red, then the indicator isn't measured. If it's yellow, then the indicators under analysis are constructed. If it's green, then there is an indicator produced. So this is the, um, the wheel for Mexico. So you can see that Mexico's doing really well. So if it's green or yellow, then they're on, they're on the way or they are measuring the, that particular SDG. And what I haven't shown, because I don't have time, are that in um, Colombia and Brazil, the pictures weren't so good um, and, and they were very red um, and red and orange in, in most of the areas. So, yeah, so the more green and yellow is good. Um, so, so that was a nice bit of data visualization that Data Pop did with uh, along with MIT. Okay, so the final stage of the work was then to, to uh, we'd, we wrote a report about um, all the findings and we um, ran a workshop in the UK in October 2019. It was, it was an invited workshop and it was um, people who had, were stakeholders in this project, potential partners. We had 31 participants um, in person and remote from the three, three Latin American countries in the UK. And the goals were to present and discuss the results, to explore the impact and to look at, at next steps. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I know we're running out of time. Um, so I've only got one slide on the results and conclusions, but we have a very long report, which um, the link is at the end of the slides about this. So um, there's a clear need for more data literacy training across academia. Thanks, Jen. I've got two minutes left, particularly undergraduates. Um, the, the public sector and civil society within all three countries. The, the thing that came out was the biggest training need is for the basic skills, um, as it probably is in, in the UK, actually. So this is introductory stats, foundational data analysis, basic methods, and also basic data science. And this was highlighted uh, quite prominently within all three countries. Um, and the end goal, it was, it was really clear that interviewees and attendees at the workshops thought that the end goal should be to foster the critical analyses of data rather than just the development of the pure mathematical con concepts and competencies. So another finding was that paid data fellowships were recognised as a useful intervention, intervention and they thought that the, um, that the target audience should be this kind of hybrid fellowship professional. Um, so this was where people can analyze data for social science purposes. And that, so this, the thought of this was that they would bring people together with complementary backgrounds to work on a project together. So data science and social science backgrounds. And it was felt that that would lead to a truly critical analysis of data and would have a higher impact I'm speeding up. In terms of the sustainable development goals, um, 
the outcome actually was that the, we shouldn't restrict this work to one particular SDG and that we need to remain flexible to incorporate host organizations interests um, and sectoral funding opportunities. And one of the things was to consider a specific outreach strategy to involve typically excluded subgroups and that in itself would talk to the reduced inequalities and quality education SDGs. So I'll hand over to Jackie. Sorry, I'm just um, responding. Okay, so the next steps are that we are piloting the scheme both in Brazil and uh, Colombia. So just to say, you know, watch this space because we're currently testing out the model. Um, one is in a business school in Sao Paulo and the other one is in um, where they teach mathematics. So we're looking at uh, this hybrid professional or these hybrid teams that Vanessa mentioned. Um, we want to do a lot more, we want to have an, a better understanding of the sorts of data driven careers that people go into and how we can address equality and diversity into those careers through opening doors to students um, at a younger age, so when they're still on their undergraduate degree. And finally, one of the things that we want to do is start to collect empirical narratives of these hybrid professionals or teams so that we can have a better understanding instead of just thinking of data science for social science, we can think about the hybrid na nature of doing data science or social data science is what we call it. So we'll finish there, I think, and obviously take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Jackie and Vanessa. Um, in the interest of time, I am going to go ahead and go into the intro for our next speaker, but please do feel free to um, use the Q&A right here in Zoom. Um, we'll continue to, to take questions throughout the session. So I will um, move on next to introduce our next speaker. Uh, we have Giabe Liu is the data services librarian at Boston College's O'Neill Library, where she provides services and support related to research data acquisition, management, curation, and visualization. Her research interests center on data literacy, instruction, evidence-based statistical analysis, data visualization, scholarly communication, and library assessment. And Jabe, if you're ready. Hi, everyone. Um, good day. <laughs> so um, today I am pleased to introduce our hands-on approach of building data literacy suite in the humanities. So this is a project uh, is from a more um, individual academic library perspective of collaboration between uh, different librarians uh, within the Boston College. So if you are interested in exploring more about this project, feel free to search digital history approaches and Boston College and you will find our live site there. Okay, so now let's just uh, get started. So before I dive into the details of this project, I just want to give you an overview of this project. The data we use is called information wanted this is the data set uh, created by Professor Harris from our Irish study programs. And we used this data set for a number of tasks in this project. And we created a number of visualizations using uh, several digital scholarship tools um, because we want to uh, demonstrate enough examples, visualization examples for our students in history and in, in humanities in general, the possibilities of working with data. And, uh, and also this is a collaborated project by four librarians at Boston College. In addition to my role, we also have data and the visualization librarian, Alison Xu, head of digital scholarship, Sarah Melton, and our history liaison, B. Lehman. And and I also want to briefly discuss about um, the main goals behind this project, because for students, especially students in within humanity history and background, they don't usually connect their study with data or digital scholarship products. So we want to, so in this project, we want to create enough variety of visualizations for students to help them get started thinking about or demonstrating or doing their research in a more digital way. So, and also by engaging them with a series of data tasks, we want to improve 
their knowledge and skills in the cycle of uh, research data. Because when students are working on their data set, they don't usually think too much. But when we are designing our project, we want to um, intentionally engage them with different tasks on the life cycle of a research data, which include acquisition, manipulation, visualization, and also management. And we also want by using our own background, knowledge, and also expertise, we want to do a pre-selection of the digital scholarship tools for our students. So now let's move to the, our um, data set. So the information wanted data set is um, a data set uh, based on numerous advertisements from a Boston local newspaper, which is called a Boston Pilot. So uh, in between the year from 1831 to 1920, there have been continuous um, P, um, advertisements posted by Irish immigrants group, group, uh, immigrant group looking for their relatives and friends. So this data set was extracted from the uh, job um, from the newspaper advertisement specifically. Um, by and the, the value or the richness of this data set is, in addition to the name that people are looking for, um, there are also a lot of demographic information available in this data set, which include their uh, gender, their age, their occupation, the the departure place and also the arrival place when they arrived in the United States. So it actually provides a vivid snapshot of the immigrants in, in that time period. So, and also because this data set has already been collected and, and extracted into a spreadsheet format, students may find it's uh, pretty easy just to get started working on their data projects without doing too much tedious work. And also a closer look at this data uh, of this data uh, data set. If you go to our uh, Boston College Dataverse, you will find this data set have three files. One is the information wanted codebook, which provides a detailed description of the variable and also the, the explanation of each variable, and also the data set itself, which is in tabular format. And also, there is an uh, information wanted data entry form, which they used originally for data entry. So this is the, this data set. And I also want to talk a little bit about the concepts when we are planning for this project. So basically, we understand there will be several common stages when students are working on their uh, course projects or research projects. Students will need to do the data acquisition because they need to look for the data sources to get started. And after they've collected enough data, they need to do a number of manipulation and transformation to make the data set um, workable for their uh, next step, which is probably the visualization. So they will be a lot of tasks or uh, knowledge or skills will be uh, required in this stage. And also when we move to the visualization, because there are so many visualization types and also so many digital scholarship tools outside online, we want to introduce a number of open source tools that students will have um, no, um, will have a free access uh, for a very long time and which is also a spreadsheet, which also use the spreadsheet structure to drive. And the last but not least, we want to get students to uh, we want to help students to start thinking about the importance of data management, and because they the students use the data set from our data repository and they need to read through the documentation provided in, under this data set, so it's a good practice for them to understand what is data documentation and what is the best practice for a long term preservation. So, so that's our the, like the several chains we try to incorporate in this project together. And next, let's move to um, each part individually. So for acquisition, of course, the main part is our information wanted data set. 
as you can see, this is only a small set of the variables available in this data set. We have the name, we have the year. The year will help students to narrow down their research scope um, and also the uh, demographic inf information, including sex, including gender and age, and also there are also uh, occupation information in this data set as well. And in addition to the main data set, a lot of times students will need to find information outside. So, uh, so we want to we we want to students to look for the information such as uh, historical statistics of the United States, uh, because United States Census Bureau provides the census uh, statistics uh, freely accessible to the public. But for such historical statistics, it's usually provided in the scanned version. So um, by looking, by working on this project, we just want to students to have the experience of going to such historical documentation and look for a specific table for them to use. For in this case, so immigrants by country in that period will probably be a particular interesting for them. And in addition to the outside statistics, we also introduce the OCR to them. And because, because of this, this data set is already provided in the tabular format, so there, there's no need for them to get uh, started from the very beginning. But we also thought it's a good chance to start talking about OCR, what is OCR? So in this part, we introduced an open source tool, which is called Transcript Bus. This is an open source and desktop uh, tool for, to, for the work uh, for doing the text recognition. And students can use the information wanted newspaper, which is also available in our special collections to do a few trial recognition on their own. And by doing their uh, own OCR, they will understand the quality of the, uh, of the digital text really depends on the quality of the scanned newspaper. And also, whenever you are doing the OCR, there will always be a lot of data cleaning and uh, um, data cleaning involved in, in the OCR step. So this is, um, so these are the several tools we're thinking of data acquisition part. And when we move to the uh, data cleaning, uh, so for text data, the data cleaning is kind of the, the step you will never be able to skip. So for example, in this data set, there is a variable which is called, uh, which is called home county, which is the uh, departure place of these immigrants. So as you can see, although this information is already extracted and entered by the form into this data set, there is still a lot of inconsistency in the, uh, in the uh, detailed records. So we thought it's a good chance to introduce a few Excel spreadsheet skills to help them, uh, help them Build the skills or knowledge of data cleaning in this part in particular. So, um, and so we just want to show them how to convert all of this to Cork Island in the standard format. Because when they need to do, for example, the total number of people depart from this country, uh, the inconsistent uh, place name won't work for this purpose. And also, similarly, for uh, for building controlled vocabulary. As you can see in our original uh, data um, variable, there are a number of small uh, occupations such as clothes finisher, dressmaker, tailor, which can all, all be uh, categorized to a bigger category, which is clothing. Because when you are doing the uh, visualization, um, visualize that such small category doesn't make too much sense because you'll make your visualization too busy and miss the uh, most important information. So we will introduce a concept of controlled vocabulary first and also use utilize a few functions in Excel and help them to build a shorter list of the occupation as well. And then the last part, um, the last important part we want to introduce is the data merging. So in this original data set, this data set is provided in one spreadsheet. So because we want to introduce this concept or this skill, we specifically split this data set into two parts. Um, one is occupation and one is uh, departure and arrival places and to keep the record ID both available in two places. The reason we want to we, we want to introduce this skill specifically is because 
uh, including multiple data sources into one is so common when students are working on their uh, data projects. And uh, the understanding of the importance of an ID is the kind of the, the foundation of conducting a successful merging. So just by engaging them to do a simple merging by themselves, we just want to show them the importance of ID and a few and how to do the merging by themselves. And after that is the is more like the um, important part, which is the presentation part, because um, all the work you've done before is for presenting your research to your audience. So when we are thinking of uh, the data visualization, especially what types of data visualization we want to introduce in this project is we want to introduce in addition to the traditional visualization types like charts, graphs, maps, we also want to do introduce some more emergent data visualization like network, story, uh, story map, and also text visualization. And our goal is we want to select a few number of tools that can be driven by the spreadsheet look data and the students may find it's not that difficult to get started with all of this visualization types. And a few a quick overview of the tools we selected for the text analysis, we select the VOINT, which has a very good or substantial user document that students may find very helpful when they get started. And also Tableau, which has a one year free access for students so students will have enough time to explore in this tool and also because of the the dragging function in this part in this tool students may find it more intuitive to get to do some uh, visualization by themselves and for Gabby uh, because the students use the spreadsheet to do the data work so this for Gabby, it's a more kind of natural extension to to convert your data to the network uh, data requirement and then output your spreadsheet to the Gabby to make a network visualization. And for the story map, it's more like a wrap up visualization for all the projects you have conducted because for a story map, you will be um, add multiple multimedia components. So it will be a good wrap up for all the visualization you have done in different tools. So a, a very quick uh, overview of some examples of our visualizations we created uh, in this project. So for this demographic information, we used a, a Tableau dashboard because the ta Tableau dashboard has more intuitive or dynamic uh, demonstration of the information. And also the Tableau public will allow you to post a template for students and students find it's, more, uh, it's easier to adopt when they, are, uh, when they get started. And also for the mapping, uh, we adopted the uh, Excel spreadsheet, Excel 3D map function for students to do the mapping. This function is available after 2000, uh, 2000, 2016 version. So the reason we want to introduce this tool is because uh, it's because it is. Um, it doesn't require any specific or professional geospatial uh, data, but just the real name of the places. So it has a pretty good recognition of different levels of the names in from the country name and the state name and within the United States, they can also understand the street address, the zip code, and also the county. So we find it's an actual a natural extension to this information wanted data set. And also a wrap up of the story map in this project as well. And then, um, at the end of this uh, cycle, we want to reiterate the importance of data management because students have uh, used all the documents from this data set. It makes more sense for us to uh, for us to go through the data repository, long term preservation, the metadata and the copyright terms again with students and also let them know the importance and the benefits the public can get if the research data can be shared uh, with the public. So this just a wrap up of our project. We want to create this uh, research data life cycle that we anticipate the students might uh, encounter in their uh, own research projects and trying to connect different dots into one and make enough examples just to 
uh, just to show students and let them have the confidence to get started. And uh, I'll just use one more minute. Thanks for the reminder. So I just, uh, a few final thoughts on working on this project. So for the core skills for developing such projects, so for us, because we are uh, specialized in, in Excel, so we just uh, invest more time on the, on the Excel spreadsheet and also all the tools related surround it. So, but for other libraries, uh, you will definitely, you can definitely divide, uh, develop your project based on the specialties of your librarians with your library. And you might notice that we have the level differentiation under each example because we want the students to under uh, to have a basic expectation of the time and the skills required for each example they see, and uh, and so we kind of provide such information. And this project is still going on because we have the data set as the core part in this, and we will, uh, we will add more tools and visualization examples to this part, just trying to uh, demonstrate more examples to the students. And uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Xiaofe, that was wonderful. Um, in the interest of time, I am gonna go ahead and move into intros for our last presenters. Um, please do use Q&A to ask any questions of any of our presenters thus far. Um, so I'm pleased to next present. Uh, we have Jeremy Bueller is a data librarian at the UBC Library Research Commons, responsible for the University of British Columbia's collection of open and licensed data. He works alongside specialists in GIS, digital scholarship and research data management to provide access to data for teaching and research and to help researchers develop skills in data analysis, manipulation and visualization. And he's joined by Kevin Manuel, who's a data librarian at Ryerson University and provides support for data discovery and retrieval. He is part of the Geospatial Map and Data Center team in the library. And recently he has been in a working group with Ontario Data Community to develop a finding guide for data librarians at Ontario University so they can locate microdata on racialized and indigenous populations in Canada. Jeremy and Kevin. Thank you, Jen. Um, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for our session this afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to co-present with my friend and colleague uh, Jeremy Bueller from the University of British Columbia. Our session is not always invisible, finding the data about marginalized and underrepresented populations in Canada. And I wanted to start with an Indigenous land acknowledgement. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Hello everyone. And in this uh, widely distributed Zoom environment, I'm coming from Vancouver, where I live and work on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Our presentation today is about a data literacy initiative uh, originally intended to help library staff and researchers learn to find data about marginalized and underrepresented populations in Canada. We're going to start with a bit of brief context, then hear from Kevin about the series of presentations he developed at Ryerson University. I later uh, adapted Kevin's presentations and I'll talk about presenting them to a UBC audience and we'll conclude with some reflections on outcomes and opportunities that arose from this work. The Census of Canada, of course, is a key source of data about the Canadian population. It's now conducted every five years with the most recent census, some of you may be aware, taking place this year, just a few weeks ago. So the census is a first stop for many seeking population data, but it's really important for researchers to be aware of the context and history uh, of the census questionnaire and of the enumeration methods, since these have a pretty big impact on whether and how marginalized people are represented. The terminology has changed over time, of course, and uh, the questions themselves have changed with new concepts and new questions emerging. Uh, one of those is the uniquely Canadian term, uh, visible minorities, which was added to the census in the 1990s to collect data for what was then the new Employment Equity Act. The key point here is, that there are always questions over the years about how well the census reflects Canadian society. And one of the main goals of this series of presentations was encouraging critical reflection on this topic of representation. Um, 
I'll turn it back to Kevin to talk a little bit about the presentations at Ryerson. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, some of you may recall uh, attending ISIS 2014 uh, in Toronto and at uh, Ryerson University. And uh, Ryerson is uh, within uh, downtown Toronto, which is the largest uh, city in Canada. So uh, as of 2020, 6.5 million in the census metropolitan area. And and um, over the end of Toronto's uh, population uh, identified as indigenous or racialized. In. And as such, there are uh, over 250 ethnicities, making it one of the most diverse cities uh, in the world. And Toronto is home to one of the largest uh, LG, actually the largest LGBTQ plus community in Canada. And there are over 45,000 students with 100 plus uh, undergraduate and graduate programs. And the library is right at the center of campus. So um, as we're a very diverse uh, city uh, and our community uh, at the university is very diverse as well, receive a number of different types of questions about finding uh, data about their particular uh, communities. And so based on those types of questions, um, there was a lot of interest from our library staff uh, to learn more about marginalized and underrepresented populations in uh, Toronto and in Canada. So I developed a series of one hour information sessions for our reference staff. And this uh, was between November 2019 and January 2020. So in each of these sessions, there was about uh, 30 attendees and it was uh, um, taking place in our map and data center, which we were able to provide uh, hands-on uh, learning exercises in the lab computers. So, um, the uh, co-presenters uh, that I invited to present with me were on various different topics. So we did uh, race and ethnicity, indigenous peoples, mental health addiction and homelessness, and also LGBTQ plus peoples. So the first uh, session that we conducted was on uh, race and ethnicity. A very common question that we get uh, about data uh, with the library is where is race in the census? So this is um, historically very complicated within the Canadian census. Uh, I co-presented with my colleague, Namir Ahmad, who's an anthropologist and library's digital media coordinator. And so we took a look at the history of the census and racial origin first appeared in 1901. Previous to that, back to the first census, uh, it was uh, just as national origin. And then race was used up until 1941. And then after that, it was a combination of origin or uh, ethnicity. So currently uh, the census is uh, using ethnicity and visible minority, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, appearing in 1996. Um, other questions that we received from researchers um, are often about comparing to US data. And uh, some recent questions that we had received was uh, about policing data uh, within racialized communities. And, and so looking at this, we also had a, a presentation, part of the presentation, um, looking at how the actually, you were using census ethnic categories and not the US census race classifications. So that was very uh, informative for our staff in, in helping with the questions. Uh, the next session we provided was on mental health, addiction, and homelessness. This uh, was co-presented with uh, the um, assessment and journalism librarian, Lisa Levesque. So uh, as you probably know, Canada is a federation of 10 provinces and three territories, but health is administered um, by the provinces and territories and not nationally. So uh, this data that's generated um, uh, provincially and territorially uh, is sometimes shared with Statistics Canada. Uh, and Stats Canada also conducts some health surveys as well. But health data can be restricted. Uh, there's often issues of confidentiality. So an example of that would be the uh, opioid awareness survey, uh, which is one of the topics that we were covering in the presentation. Um, and then data on homelessness was another um, important topic. Um, as Ryerson is in the city centre, there are a lot of questions about socioeconomic disparity uh, that surround the university. And um, when we come to questions of homelessness, the census often isn't very helpful because the information is collected based on where you live. So if unless somebody is in a shelter at the time, uh, they're not counted. So that's where we 
shared resources that were based on municipal municipalities and community-based organizations that uh, often collect data themselves on uh, homeless populations. Uh, the third presentation uh, was with my uh, colleague Trina Grover, the Indigenous Studies Librarian, and it was on the Indigenous peoples of Canada. So in Canada, nearly 5% of the population identify as Indigenous, and within the census, the terminology has changed over time. So up till 1981, uh, it was Native Indian, then Aboriginal from 1986 to 2016, and in 2021, which is being conducted right now, uh, it's now Indigenous. Mm. So that often makes it difficult for researchers with the changing in the, the terminology and being able to compare that over time. Um, also, some uh, Indigenous communities don't participate in the census because they consider themselves a sovereign territory and enumeration is not permitted on uh, within their communities, but they do collect the data uh, themselves. And so when you look at the census, historically, it didn't collect all data information on Indigenous, indigenous peoples, and it's a legacy of uh, colonialism. And the final presentation that we provided was about LGBTQ plus peoples in Canada and globally. And this was co-presented uh, with uh, the Trans Studies Librarian, uh, Rhys Steinberg. So in Canada, um, the census does not uh, collect uh, information on sexual orientation. This year in 2021 is the first time gender identity has been asked. Uh, there are other surveys that ask about sexual orientation, but um, it's often said to use with caution because sample sizes are uh, quite small. So when researchers are asking how many LGBTQ plus people are in Canada, it's difficult to make generalizations about the whole population uh, from those surveys. The census does have um, one variable of interest, which would be asking about same-sex marriage, which was legalized in Canada in 2005 and has been asked in the census since 2006. And so again, similar to the homeless populations and, and other community-based organizations, um, organization-based data uh, with the LGBTQ plus community, it often comes from the community itself. However, these data sets are often small and local data sets. So uh, back in 2019, I was attending the ICPSR uh, training session in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I had the pleasure of reconnecting with Jeremy, and he was asking about what sessions I was um, presenting, and I told him about this series, and he was quite interested in uh, reusing them uh, at UBC, so I was very pleased to share with him, and he'll share his experience with you now. As soon as I can find the unmute. Um, I'm, I'm indebted to Kevin for uh, getting this uh, this work started and, and sharing it with me. I'm in Vancouver, much smaller, but still very uh, diverse city, working at University of British Columbia, where a quarter of the student population uh, are international students. The sessions that uh, Kevin created for Ryerson were the foundation for a similar series at UBC. And we initially were to deliver those in person uh, much as they had in smaller hands-on settings where the audience would be library employees. But uh, the timing was right when we shifted to online learning and closed our spaces for the pandemic. And we ended up postponing the sessions for a year. In the meantime, we uh, learned from our experience facilitating other online training and led to a couple of changes from the original. The main one was extending the registration to UBC students, faculty, and staff. So this changed things a little bit. There was a little less uh, focus on the kinds of questions maybe uh, that someone would get at a, a reference desk, but engaged uh, researchers and encouraged them to bring their own questions into the, the sessions. And then like at Ryerson, we partnered with uh, UBC subject experts who provided context for each session. In that intervening year, there was much more that happened than just the change in delivery format. Um, many of the topics that we covered and their related issues of representation have come to prominence in the past year. And so the next few slides are from related news stories uh, published in 2020. Increased attention on North American policing of Black and Indigenous groups, uh, as well as on hate crimes towards Asian people, has led to more awareness of the importance of collecting race-based data and uh, 
uh, Kevin mentioned uh, the police data based in Canada on uh, on ethnicity categories is now being collected. Similar conversations have been taking place about the need to collect race-based data related to the pandemic. And uh, as Kevin also mentioned, current data collection is quite fragmented in Canada when it comes to health data with a lot of variation one from one province to the next. In part in response to this, uh, in 2020, provincial and territorial human rights commissions called on the federal government to develop a nationwide strategy for the collection of disaggregated health data. Now, I haven't been a data librarian for long, uh, but 2020 is the first time I recall hearing terms like disaggregated data uh, on the radio or popping up in the media. And I think these developments brought some immediacy to the discussions that we uh, were addressing when we brought the, the series of sessions to UBC. Much of the session content that we adapted for UBC mirrors what Kevin has already talked about. So I'm not gonna go into to those details, but I did want to acknowledge and thank uh, my UBC library colleagues who participated in this, Susan Patterson, Kayla Larson, and Ann Olson. Each of them started off the session with uh, 10 to 20 minutes, uh, sometimes more on the context and introducing people that, that set the stage for actually getting into the data sources. We asked participants to tell us one thing they liked and one thing they would change about the sessions. What you see on the right here are some comments about what they liked, uh, acknowledging that expertise and context that, uh, that they brought. And I've alluded to some of these outcomes and opportunities in previous comments, but I'll, I'll repeat them here. Uh, the supportive and collaborative development of the content across institutions and also involving librarians from various branches, uh, increased confidence and awareness among library staff. Uh, in the case of UBC, we reached a wider audience by including students, faculty and other researchers and invited them to bring their own questions and experience with brought a, a nice flavor to the sessions and pitch set, set them up sort of as a uh, a networking opportunity that led to further consultation. So there was an outreach component to this as well. I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, some outcome and opportunities uh, for me that was real value uh, in working with uh, my colleagues. They brought a lot of different perspectives from their knowledge and uh, expertise into, uh, into the various topics. And, and uh, collaborating with Jeremy has been um, uh, extremely valuable for me as well, too, because I'm seeing how he's taking this and being able to expand it and share it uh, beyond uh, the library itself. So uh, now I'm thinking of how do I present these to the, the broader uh, university community as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's always new data coming up and, and being available. So. Uh, for example, in Canada, where census 2021 data will be available in the next um, a couple of years. So we'll be able to uh, include that into new sessions in the future. Um, but then also integrating um, uh, the content into other library instructions. So working with my colleagues, suggesting to them the importance of including data in their presentations, um, co-presenting it for classrooms and, and other uh, contexts, and, and just um, reinforcing enforcing data literacy. And there's a photo of me with our Indigenous um, Studies Librarian and our uh, Library Indigenous Initiatives Liaison, and we were at an outreach with an Indigenous uh, community group right there. Mm -hmm. uh, and recently I've uh, been working with uh, Dr. Melanie Knight, who's advisor to the Dean of Blackness and Black Diasporic Education at Ryerson University. And uh, we've redeveloped and enhanced a, a Black Studies Guide that the library um, uh, has. And uh, within the guide, we've included a section on data and statistics, and she was uh, working with students to provide feedback and was very positive um, uh, feedback about the data and statistics um, section. Uh, that we included in there. So again, there's a lot of value in librarian and faculty collaboration when it comes to sharing information about marginalized and uh, vulnerable populations. And we're bumping up right against the top of the hour. So thank you all for attending. This slide just has a couple of concluding notes, uh, re-emphasizing the, the importance of critical thinking around the context of, of data collection. Uh, and we wanted to do that rather than just list data sources within this series. 
uh, as well as uh, engaging colleagues and overcoming that hesitation to present on, on some of these topics, which can be daunting for people who haven't had some exposure to them. Um, that is as far as we go. I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jeremy and Kevin. And I apologize for cutting us short, but we're right at two o'clock. So we'll go into our next session. Thank you for joining us. Please check the Whova session if you had questions unanswered. Thank you all.